So uh, really great that a lot of the students are here. Uh, about midway through, we're going to do a little bit of testing that you would do on people with concussions. And luckily, one student has volunteered to do that. So you'll get to, you'll get to see a little bit about how we assess concussions. Um, <clears throat> so let me just tell you a little bit about myself. For those that don't know me, uh, I'm a licensed psychologist. I'm a clinical neuropsychologist by training. I have specialized training in sports-related con concussions and the long-term effects of those concussions, particularly uh, the dementia that results from, from concussions. And joining me today is Laura DeCoster, and Laura's over here, and she's gonna talk first. And Laura is an athletic trainer with uh, the New Hampshire Musculoskeletal Institute, and um, she spends a lot of time training professionals on assessing concussions and, and what kind of return to play guidelines there are and things like that. How do you manage a concussion? And she's been doing this for many years and is very good at it. She's also a researcher. She's published dozens of articles on concussions. And so she's going to talk to us first about the acute effects of concussions. And then later on, I'll talk to you about the long-term effects. And I hope that um, from this talk, we don't scare you away from playing sports. Sports are awesome. They're great. Um, but if you return to play too early, or if you have a concussion and you don't let your brain heal, they can have these really dramatic long-term problems. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to take questions. Laura will take questions after her talk. I'll take mine anytime you want. Raise your hand. I'm happy to make it as interactive as possible. Okay. Um, and I'm going to try not to fall off the stage. I feel like that's going to happen. <laughs> All right, so let's welcome Laura up here. Thank you. I'm not going to fall off the stage because I'm not going to stand on it. On. Looks like me. Thank you, Daniel. As Daniel said, I am with the New Hampshire Musculoskeletal Institute. I am the executive director there. I also sit on the New Hampshire uh, Brain Injury Association of New Hampshire Board of Directors, so definitely immersed in the concussion stuff. Um, and I'll start by telling you a little bit about us so you know where I'm coming from. The Safe Sports Network is the largest program of the New Hampshire Musculoskeletal Institute, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. We're dedicated to youth sports safety because we believe that every child should have the chance to reach his or her potential. And we know that sports have benefits for kids beyond just the physical. In fact, we know that kids who participate in sports are more engaged, they have better academic achievement, they're more likely to graduate, they have a higher or better health-related quality of life than their non-athlete peers, and they're less likely to try drugs, get pregnant, or attempt suicide. So for all of those reasons, we know that sports can help keep kids safe as long as we keep kids safe in sports. That's what our mission is about. That's why I'm here on a Wednesday evening instead of home playing with my dog. All right, that's, that's what it's all about for me. So what I wanna do today is make sure that you all leave here with the basics, the very basic stuff you need to keep yourself safe, keep your kids safe or your sports playing relatives and friends safe. Uh, around concussion and I'm gonna go really fast through some stuff and if you have questions great I'll answer them after before I get to the concussion uh, piece though I want to make sure that you understand if you are related somehow to a youth sports league we're here for you safe sports network has a youth sports safety net program that brings sports safety infrastructure to your league so it's you know, uh, mostly what we do every day is we bring what pros and collegiate athletes have down to the high school level, but we, re we realize that's not the whole ball of wax. And so Steve here as one of the youth leagues that we work with can, can tell you we want to make sure that youth recreational athletes are safe, middle school athletes are safe right on up. So whether that's being prepared for emergencies, um, being prepared for concussions, or having CPR and first aid training available for your coaches, uh, just call me. You, there's contact information on your tables. All right, so if we're gonna talk about concussion, it makes sense that we're all on the same page. What is a concussion? Concussion is a brain injury. That is key. 
the old terms that used to be you know, thrown about a ding or a bell ring are no longer politically correct because they tended to minimize the importance of this injury. I mean, how much more important can you get, right, than injuring your brain? So a concussion is a brain injury that can be caused by a direct or an indirect blow. Obvious we can get hit in the head and have a concussion. Maybe not so obvious we can jolt our head, think whiplash, brain flies back and forth inside the skull, even if the skull doesn't actually get hit, concussion can result. So concussion is a brain injury that can be caused by a direct or an indirect blow that's characterized by a rapid onset of signs and symptoms that may or may not include a loss of consciousness. May not, okay? We don't have to have a loss of consciousness. And you're gonna learn right now that I say things, I repeat things that are really important. And that's a key point, so we'll come back to it. A concussion is a brain injury that can be caused by a direct or indirect blow to the head, characterized by a rapid onset of signs and symptoms that are generally short-lived. Most concussions resolve within one to two weeks, but that leaves 15% of people, right, 85% resolve, 15% don't resolve in that one to two weeks, and taking care of them is a big uh, issue. And lastly, a concussion is a functional impairment. It's not structural. What does that mean? What that means to you today in 2016 is we can't see it on neuroimaging studies. CT scan is going to be normal. An MRI scan is going to be normal. And there still can be a concussion present. We're going to come back to the, that again also. So that's what a concussion is. So we've got all, it took me a whole slide and five minutes to tell you what a concussion is. How are you, non-medical people, supposed to recognize it? And recognizing it is important because that's what the last 15 years of all this press has been about is a lot of concussions were going unrecognized. And even though concussion research is crazy, I mean, we're getting 10 or 15 new peer-reviewed journal articles every week. One thing we do know is if we never know the kid had a concussion, their outcome isn't going to be as good as it would have been if we had recognized it and taken care of them appropriately in the first place. That's why I'm here. I want to make sure that people know the basics so that they can recognize when this brain injury has occurred and then we can step in and do the right things. Loss of consciousness may or may not be present in a concussion. In fact, only 10% of concussions have loss of consciousness. Memory loss may also be present. Those are two of 25 to 30 signs and symptoms that are recognized to be part of this sort of concussion syndrome, if you will. One symptom or sign is enough for a concussion diagnosis. It does not have to be loss of consciousness. And that means that there's an awful lot of things that could be going on. And the reason for that is your brain controls everything, right? So anything that your brain does can be affected by your brain not working right. In that scenario then, how, how do we know? How could you be expected to recognize a concussion? So hopefully you can see that and the lights aren't too bright. So this is one picture you might see. This kid looks like his head hurts, I think. A picture I don't have is the deer in the headlights, blank, stare, sort of glazed-eyed look. That's what a concussion looks like, OK? Signs and symptoms, though, there are four main categories that signs and symptoms of a concussion fit in right now. That's how we're, we're shoehorning them into different things. So the first are the physical signs and symptoms. Headache. 10% have loss of consciousness. 90% have a headache, OK? They might be dizzy, they might be drowsy, they might be nauseous and vomiting, they might be sensitive to light or to noise. Those are the sort of physical category. And I'm not going to give you an exhaustive list here. I'm just going to give you information so that you understand the basic categories. Cognitive effects, right? Your brain, everybody knows your brain's for thinking. So you might be confused. You might have a hard time concentrating. You might feel foggy or feel slowed down, people complain about. Those are the cognitive uh, signs and symptoms. Your brain controls your emotions, too. As much as we might say it was a gut feeling or I felt it in my heart, it's still this thing up here. And so 
people who have a concussion uh, likely have some sort of emotional component. They feel depressed, they're foggy, they, uh, I'm sorry, they're crabby, they're sad, they're irritable. They're, if you know this person, they're not themselves. They're just not quite right. So those are the emotional component. And we'll round out with a fourth one, and that is some sort of sleep disturbance. Not enough sleep, too much sleep, can't fall asleep, can't stay asleep, can't wake up, fill in the blank. All right, those are the four general categories and some of the 25 to 30 signs and symptoms that are recognized. Overwhelming, right? Do I have to remember all of that? No, you don't have to remember all of that. You have to remember that anything your brain controls might be off and be sensitive to that. But you also have to know which things really truly are important and which things make you want to call 911. All right? There's only four bullets on this slide. And the first two, you don't really need me for. Because if someone's unconscious, they're not responsive to you, I'm pretty sure whether you came here tonight, you were going to call for an ambulance. Just guessing. There are a couple things within this bullet, though, that I want to point out. Extended or late loss of consciousness. Extended in the scope of concussion might be 15 or 30 seconds because most concussion loss of consciousness episodes are momentary. What does momentary mean? You're running down the field, you catch the ball, you get hit in the head, you're out. You know he's out if you're watching it on TV, right? Because he fell down face first without ever putting his hands down. But then by the time someone's out to him, he's, you know, he's groggy, but he's no longer unconscious. That's momentary. On the other hand, if you're on the sideline and the play happens and everybody else gets up and you realize, oh, Johnny didn't get up, and then you go out to Johnny and Johnny's still out, in the concussion world, that's extended, okay? I would call 911 in that scenario. Or late, okay? A lot of the things on this red flag slide are going to refer to things that indicate increasing pressure inside the skull whether it's swelling or bleeding, those are still brain injury, more serious than a concussion, which isn't structural. We could get into that, but that would be a whole other talk. Um, and so whether or not you have that initial momentary loss of consciousness, if you later lose consciousness or have a decreasing level of consciousness, you're lucid, you're making sense, and suddenly you're not, you know, you're looking at a kid who was making sense talking to you five minutes ago and now he's confused and that's not something you want to sit on, okay? It might be fine. It might turn out to be nothing but better safe than sorry. Seizure and posturing activity. Again, you don't need me to tell you if it, first of all, in both of these cases, we've got prolonged unconsciousness, right? But if someone's having a seizure or if someone's, you know, rigidly flexed or extended, you're probably going to call 911. You didn't need to come here tonight. I didn't need to come here tonight for that. But it's something that should be pointed out. We get a little bit less clear, though, when you get to this vomiting bullet. And you'll see I've got repeated there because the medical advice is you want to look for repeated vomiting. Well, if I have a mechanism of injury, I got hit in the head or I had my head jolted, and the, the, the child I'm working with vomits once, I'm probably going to call. And I am a medical professional, all right? I'd, better, I'd rather be safe than sorry. Now, I will say if you have a child who you know throws up when he you know, watches TV and someone throws up or someone threw up around the corner last week, you can wait for the second time, all right? Some of those things are just sort of gut calls, clinical calls, and based on knowing the kid. And finally, and this is the one that's most important to me. You need to be alert, and, and what's behind it is you need to be alert for signs or symptoms that there's pressure increasing inside the skull. What are those? You know, you're, you've got a headache that's maybe three out of 10, you're sitting there doing nothing, and suddenly your headache is eight out of 10. You didn't go out and run a marathon or play your video game for two hours. I'm not talking about I feel worse because. I feel worse for no reason, all right? They're more confused, their headaches worse. Fill in the blank, any one of those 25 or 30 symptoms, but especially looking for a decreasing level of consciousness like I talked about earlier. 
all right? Generally speaking, although concussion signs and symptoms do evolve over time, we want them to sort of look the same or be getting better. We don't want sudden spikes of worseness, if that's a word. Other things that you should be aware of when we're dealing with young athletes is it looks like kids have more concussions than adults have. For the blow by blow, you know, the same uh, impact that hits an adult's head or jolts an adult's head um, or a kid's head might cause an injury in a kid that wouldn't bother an adult. Also, the younger kids are, it looks like they are going to take longer for their concussion to resolve. I mentioned earlier, 85% within one to two weeks. Well, at the college level, that's more like 90%, and at the high school level, that's more like 75%. You're looking at the youth level, that might be longer. Kids are more likely to suffer from long-term problems than adults, and whether that's long two months or long two years, um, it, the research makes it look like that's the truth, that kids are going to suffer from this a little bit longer than adults are. And I heard some people talking about second impact syndrome earlier. Kids have an increased risk of second impact syndrome. That's, they got a second blow to the head before the con first concussion had resolved. Why do we care? We care because it's 100% bad news. 50% of those kids dies, die, and 50% of those kids you know, can't talk, can't walk, can't function after. We don't want second impact syndrome. It's fortunately very rare, but this is why we are so focused on making sure kids are returning safely. We talked about concussion being structural, sorry, functional, not structural, because we can't see it with common imaging techniques. Uh, I will let the cat out of the bag a little bit. There's great research going on. There's some functional MRI. There's some EEG stuff. There's some blood tests coming. Something's going to happen so that we've got an answer to this, and it's not an all-clinical gut feeling, and we're not relying on a kid who's got some other motivating factors to lie to us to tell us how he's feeling. Something's going to happen. But right now, we can't see a concussion. A negative CT scan, and this is why this is important to a lay population, a negative CT scan doesn't mean you don't have a concussion. So don't take your child to a hospital. I understand you're scared to death. And the doctor wants to send you home with a CT scan. Believe me, if the doctor's worth his salt, that is a good thing. Because the doctor's looking for those symptoms that make it look like there's increasing pressure inside the skull before he's going to pull the trigger or she's going to pull the trigger and risk this huge amount of radiation on a growing brain, all right? It is not indicated in the absence of signs and symptoms that make it look like there's a uh, worse brain injury there. So what's a person to do? We can't see it, right? How do we know if someone has a concussion? Well, maybe we can do some testing of brain functions, right? That's what we're talking about. The brain's maybe not working. The obvious stuff, cognitive assessment, memory, reaction time, concentration, balance, vision, both static and dynamic, all of those things are useful to a clinician in an effort to try to identify when a concussion has resolved. Those things are not diagnostic and they're not perfect. Really important for you to understand because, you know, media grabs on to oh, this concussion test is going to say if you have a concussion and it's going to say when it's safe to go back, and it's just not the case. There are lots of weaknesses in all of these tests. They're not a blood test. They're not, you know, you break your leg, you go get in an x-ray machine, they shoot a picture, it's broken, that is diagnostic. We don't have that for a concussion yet. All these tests are is an indicator of when you're back to baseline, all right? So if we're lucky enough that the child who's concussed has a baseline test and we try to get out there, we did 2,500 baseline concussion tests last year, try to get out there, do as many as we can, and we have the results of their memory, reaction time, concentration, balance, et cetera, so that when they are concussed, we can wait for them to feel better, we can test them again to see when it looks like their brain is functioning the way it was before they got knocked in the head. 
how do we get them back to play? How do we know they're safe? Well, the first thing is we wait for them to be asymptomatic. The definition of rest during this period of time when we're waiting for them to be asymptomatic is changing, it's evolving. We're getting a little bit more, uh, we're getting away from the sit in a dark room and have no stimulus to, you know, a generally accepted definition is uh, a threshold below which there's no increase in symptoms, return of symptoms, or development of new symptoms. All right, so we're gonna wait for them to become asymptomatic, and we're going to then start them on a gradual return to play. This return to play is going to take at least five days, five to seven days or more. The guidelines suggest that each stage of the return to play protocol be at least 24 hours. I've said at least and I've said or more. That's because this is a clinical feeling. Remember, we don't have any tests for this. This is clinical and the better your clinician is at this, the better. But one thing I'll just throw out there is if it takes six weeks for your child to feel better for his concussion, rushing him back over five days might not be the best move. All right, we might say 48 hours at each level. But that's what's behind that. So they're gonna start with light activity, they're gonna to progress to, to more sports specific activities and drills where we're still protecting them from getting whacked in the head. You know, whether it's in no equipment at all or they're wearing the red penny like the, the guy in the middle. And then eventually they're going to return to gameplay. We're going to make use of those concussion tests at various points along the way and various clinicians will do this differently. Sometimes we will get them out to the point right before they start hitting again, and we'll give them another test to see whether their, their increased activity made their uh, brain function look bad again. For youth and middle school kids where we don't have an athletic trainer on site like we do at eight high schools around town, we run a free injury drop-in clinic. Everything that kids get there is free, whether it's a concussion evaluation or an ankle evaluation or anything in between. Um, and everything we do is supported by community donations. So there's no charge, there's no collection of insurance information. We're glad to accept a donation though. If you're happy with you know, what happened with your kid and you wanna make sure that those services are available for the next kid. Questions? If I have time, do I have time? Okay. Yes. Yes. Oh. And yeah. No doubt. That being said, are you seeing any drawing back of uh, parents who are, who are unwilling to uh, have their children engage in certain activities? So the, the question points out very, very accurately that not only does sports benefit kids in the ways that I mentioned, but teaches things that, boy, how else would you teach teamwork and responsibility and you know, your part of the team and how the team all falls down if you don't do your part. Sports, it's an incredible way to achieve all of that stuff. And we are living in just, you know, Daniel alluded to it earlier, we don't want people to say, oh, well, my, my child's not gonna play sports because these things happen to you know, maybe 15 or 20% of the athletes that are out there, and hopefully they get the right care. And sometimes bad things happen and there's absolutely nothing we can do about them. But everything in life is a risk benefit calculation. And the benefits of sports by and large are much higher than the risks, but the risks are there and that's why my organization exists. Um, so my question is, I guess it's a two-part question. The first is sort of about um, the types of sort of actions that lead to concussions. That I guess the difference between sort of like an impact versus uh, more of like a brain shaking type injury where someone is, for example, moving in one direction and then abruptly is stopped or if they're falling and they hit the ground like that, it's like the brain sort of gets shaken inside the head as opposed to just an impact. Um, and how that relates to the way we think about designing protective equipment, especially for children because their neck muscles aren't as strong. Like, it seems to me as helmets get 
more protective, they get bigger and heavier, which seems like it might actually increase the sort of centripetal force when someone is like s abruptly stopped and therefore it might almost increase the danger of uh, the head being <clears throat> almost like shaken. And I don't know if, if people have talked about this or thought about this or what the prevailing views are on it. Uh, there's a lot of research into equipment. There's a huge race to find the concussion proof helmet, which probably doesn't exist because you know we can pat outside, but we can't pat inside, and the brain's still likely to hit the inside of the skull. Although there is some new technology that's sort of absorbing some of that outside so that it doesn't happen inside as much. Um, whether anybody's thinking about it, absolutely. We've got the NFL GE Under Armour Head Health Challenge grant that's a half a million dollars per researcher each year um, that's going out. And in fact, you guys are, may be aware with your UNH connection, um, one of my close colleagues and a member of our board of directors, Eric Swartz at UNH, got one of those Head Health Challenge grants, not on the equipment level, but on the, on the question of does it make sense to train tackling without the helmet in place so they develop body mechanics that keeps their head out even when they have their helmet on? And does that reduce the number of hits, training them that way, does that reduce the number of hits that they take or give when they actually have the helmet on? And so far the data show, yeah, it's working. So that, there's a lot of research on that. Are all Any other questions or I'll kind of jump in? I got, a, I got a quick one. You said kids suffer more long-term effects typically. Is that due to non-reporting, you think? It's going to be hard to give you an evidence-based answer on that mm -hmm. because a lot of our evidence comes from, you know, a culture that continues to reward people for toughing it out and not telling. Um, but I think, I think it's really there. Uh, you know, I think there's just a difference in, in the recovery. And there's uh, controversy or discussion or debate, I guess is the right word, around you know, is a child's brain have better plastic, plasticity and therefore more likely to heal better, or are they you know, young and more vulnerable? Right. And I, I think they're just going to take longer. There's so much going on, you know. They're they're busy laying down new stuff all the time, not passive like us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have the statistics or I guess research showing for kids that have suffered two that may not have been within the same as you had said they hadn't fully healed per se, but still maybe within the same season of sports, let's say one who gets one towards the beginning comes back to play kind of thing and then towards the end ends up getting ricocheted again. Uh, is the damage the same because there's a bit of space, or are they finding that it's pretty much later on the same kind of damage being done without space? So the question is, do repetitive or multiple or subsequent concussions cause more damage than if you only had one, and is there second impact syndrome risk if two or three months have gone by, right? right? Um, the second impact syndrome risk, I would say no. It appears that there's something chemical physiological that goes on in the brain during that phase. And a concussion is definitely, there are definitely chemical markers of it. There are things going on chemically, and they think that something about that, that chemical situation triggers what is basically, and there may be too much information, but it triggers the brain to swell immensely and rapidly such that within five seconds your brain shoves out of your skull, and that's what kills people. Um, to address the other part, there is definitely a higher risk of subsequent concussions. If you have one concussion, you're definitely more likely to have your second concussion and your third concussion. And there's still a lot of research now into whether the effects of those are additive, but I think the answer is yes. Um, I, and I think that's only going to get clearer. I'm taking up all of Daniel's time. You can you can start talking whenever you want, man. <laughs> Do you know what the the, the long-term 10, 20, 30-year consequences are for someone who I had a student who had multiple concussions during her high school days. Yeah. Um, 
does she have something to worry about when she's 30 or 40 or 50? That well, someone who I didn't. think that's going to be the, the everything that Daniel's touching on. Um, I, yes, I, I, unfortunately, I think she probably does. But um, I, a lot of the trouble with answering that question is we only have retrospective studies. We don't have controlled long-term prospective studies where we can weed out the other things that might cause those problems that she's going to encounter. And we're still dealing with humans who, you know, we're not going to put them in a vacuum and go out 20 or 30 years and, and everything they, that happens to them is because of that concussion with nothing else in there. So it's going to be a hard question to answer unless or until we get some marker, some blood marker, some something that, that helps us know. And the last thing I'll scare you with is we're talking about this one to two weeks and kids are, pay, people are back to normal and, they, and we're putting them then through a five to seven day return to play and we're sending them back and they're back to school and they're back to all their classes and there are at least two studies and these are from getting to be four and five years ago now so there are probably mm -hmm. more that show that those people still have EEG changes and they still have functional deficits and our brains are plastic and they find ways around them, but when they test those specific things, they aren't right. So whether, whether someone's ever resolved for a from a concussion, don't know. It's still an unanswered question. Thank you very much, Laura. That was fantastic. Can we give her a... Thank you. Thank you. So uh, that was a great question by Steve, and so I'm going to follow up on that. My talk is going to be uh, about the long-term consequences associated with, uh, with concussions. <laughs> Before we do that, uh, Laura had mentioned that there's a lot of different testing that can happen to evaluate somebody who's had a concussion. And what you want to do is test before, so you get a baseline, and then test them later on and see how they've changed, right? And if they're doing much worse later on, we're going to say, hey, the brain's still not working right. Okay, and some of that's cognitive testing and some of that's balance testing. I thought a fun way to start would be to test some balance testing so you guys can see the, the testing that we do to evaluate concussions. And I know I have one student that's willing to volunteer, but I thought it'd be fun if we can get a student and maybe a faculty member. Or, 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 maybe, a, or maybe a dean. Just, uh, <laughs> you like... All right, Nick. So, so come on up. So this is a test we do to assess balance. And remember, a concussion can affect balance. It can affect, cogn or affect cognitive skills. But this is balance. So come on up, guys. It's definitely a competition. All right. So this is, we're going to make this a competition. It's going to be more fun that way. Um, but this is a test that we use clinically. I'm just going to do certain pieces of it just for time, okay? Just so you guys can get a feel for it. The first thing we need them to do is take off their shoes. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't tell you that, did I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hope the socks match. <laughs> and this test is called the balance error scoring system. It's, it's one of the methods we use to assess balance. And you do these tests both with your eyes open and then again with your eyes closed. But just so for time, we're going to skip to the fun part with the eyes closed. So can I have you guys both stand on the mat? And we're going to start with an easy one. And what we would do clinically is we would give these tests and we would count for how many errors they have, how many times they move out of their place, if they fall over, things like that. Hopefully they won't fall over. We'll see. <laughs> so the first one's very simple. They're going to put their feet together. Hands at your hips. When I say go, you're going to close your eyes for 30 seconds, and we're going to look for any kind of movement in your body, any tiptoeing, any kind of balancing like that. And fair warning, this is the easy one. It's going to get worse. All right? Uh, we'll, we'll make it quicker. We'll make it 15 seconds for time, OK? All right, so on three, close your eyes. One, two, three. That was pretty good, huh? All right, you guys can open your eyes. Good. So now next one, what I'm going to have you do is put your dominant foot in the front. So if you're right, yep, awesome. And your non-dominant foot directly behind it. 
heel to toe, so you're touching. Fantastic. Nick's already looking bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't let you guys fall, I promise. Same things, uh, hands at the hips. And again, clinically, we would do this before and after, and we would look for changes and, and for any kind of errors in their balance. So, uh, you guys ready? <laughs> Should I be more concerned about Nick? I'm going there. <laughs> All right, so on three, close your eyes. One, two, three. Pretty good. That'd be great. Good. You guys can open your eyes. <laughs> All right. Didn't have any recent concussions, so we don't have problems yet. But now it's going to be the worst one. Um, you're going to stand on your, we're going to do your non-dominant foot, so probably your left foot. You're going to stand on one foot. You're going to have your back leg about six inches off the ground, and we're going to do the same thing. What do you guys think? You ready for this? No, 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 no. Leg back. There we go, and then about six inches down, right there. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, go over there. <laughs> <laughs> I got you, Nick. <laughs> All right. One, two, three. Oh, there's an error. There's more. Really, just one. All right, so that's good. Good job, guys. Thank you. <laughs> so again, what we would do clinically is, thank, and I really appreciate you guys coming up here. That was great. What we do clinically is we'll test somebody before and after. We'll count their errors. And a healthy person, no concussions, everything's doing fine, probably make a handful of those type of errors. After a concussion, that, that rate might double. Okay, So you can get a feel for that. So let's talk about... Uh, some of the long-term uh, problems associated with concussions. And we'll talk a little bit about what a concussion is from a brain basis. I'll talk about brain changes in a concussion. We'll talk about sub-concussive injury. And just for a show of hands, how many people have heard of sub-concussive injuries? Good number of you guys. And this will relate to your question that you had earlier. Uh, we find that people that didn't even know they had a concussion have brain changes, even though they've never de you know, determined that they had a concussion. And we think that's due to these sub-concussive injuries. Then we're going to talk about the dementia that's associated with concussions called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and then we'll watch a, a PBS documentary. It's called League of Denials, and it talks about what the NFL uh, has known and kind of where they're going as it relates to, to concussions. So uh, the first thing to know is that there's approximately three to four million sports-related concussions that occur in the U.S. annually. But that number is probably really, really bad, right? If we don't know, if people don't know what a definition or what a concussion is, how do we know how many there are? You guys, you guys see what I mean? We just don't know. So there's maybe three to four million, but boy, I would guess that number's twice that or, or three times that. How many people here, if you feel comfortable, you don't have to respond, how many have had a concussion? Fantastic. Sort of fantastic. I don't know. <laughs> Who's more likely to get a concussion, men or women? playing sports? What do you guys think? Men. I see some men. Votes for, let's raise our hands. How many say men? How many say women? Yeah, women are much more likely to get concussions playing the same sports than men. Uh, so baseball and softball, basketball, you know, basketball, women are much more likely to get concussions. Overall, though, men get more concussions from football. About three quarters of the concussions that, are, that occur from high school sports occur in football. So men are much more likely to get concussions, but if you look at the rates, women are much more likely to get them per unit of play. Does that kind of kind of make some sense? So there's a misconception uh, that co a concussion happens when you lose consciousness, and Laura talked about that earlier. That is not the case. It occurs any time you have an impact to your head that causes neurological symptoms. And uh, I worked on a study a couple years ago that we asked people, how many concussions did you have? These were, these were former athletes or professional athletes. They were NFL football players. And they would say, oh, I had about seven or eight, right? Then we gave them a definition that said, well, concussions, anytime you hit your head and you get any of these symptoms, a headache, balance problems, dizziness, sensitivity to noise or light, difficulty concentrating, things like that, the rate doubled and tripled, 
right? So when people realize that you get a hit to the head, causes neurological symptoms for any amount of time, the rates dramatically increase. So that makes me believe that this three to four million is probably a very low number. Oh, oh I ruined it. You guys want to see some concussions? Still stopping. Go, go. Oh, my gosh. When I played football as a kid, we'd hit our heads intentionally to get woozy. That was like the goal. Still got a PhD, though. It's concussion in basketball. Pretty severe. Some of you guys have seen this. So concussions, of course, happen in sports, but they also happen in regular life. Um, I play this because mostly I think it's funny. Um, everybody know what a trust fall is? Right? So you stand there. If you trust the person, you fall back. They catch you. They don't catch you. Bad news. Right? Could have a concussion. So here's a... Uh, could happen in everyday life. Or close your eyes and just fall down, okay? Okay, then Lauren's going to catch you. Close your eyes, okay. Okay, it's called the trust fall. Okay, trust fall. Ready, set, go. <laughs> go to cause a concussion. <laughs> Sorry, I just find that one funny. So a concussion, concussion occurs when you have brain changes. Something's going wrong with your brain. And I want to show just a clip of this video to illustrate how soft and gentle your brain is in your skull. Right? Your brain is about the texture of jello. Right? It is very, very, very soft. A human brain can be easily just squashed with, just by touching it. In autopsies, taking it out of a body, you can squish through the brain if you're not careful enough just grabbing it. Or you have to be very, very gentle. The brain doesn't, isn't even strong enough to hold its own weight. If I took a brain out and put it on the table, it would start to compress. Right? And you think about that, this soft, jello-like material hitting up against hard bone. Right? It's bad news. This video is a little gross. It's a human brain. Uh, if, any, if anyone's squeamy, squeamish, maybe you might want to cover your eyes a little bit. Uh, and I'll, like, I'll wave or something to let you know. But I think it's important to see just how soft an actual human brain is. Okay? is that, if anyone's squeamish, really squeamish about blood, you might want to might leave. Everybody's okay? Okay. So we'll just watch a minute of it. And again, I'm showing this to, so you can realize just how soft the human brain is inside this skull. Okay? This, guy, this is the person that died and they just took their brain out. Students think that the brain is sort of the consistency of a rubber ball, and that's because in the laboratories and teaching specimens, we have fixed, formalin-fixed brains. However, if you're a trauma surgeon or a neurosurgeon, you realize that the brain is really very, very soft and much more vulnerable than the impression you get looking at the fixed brain. So I would like to show you a 1400 gram brain that has just been removed from an autopsy and we are fortunate enough to be able to show you what a normal unfixed recently deceased uh, patient's brain would look like. This is the ventral surface of the brain and what you see are the uh, peel vessels, this nice blush with the clear leptomeninges and the vessels running in between the arachnoid and the pia. The cerebral spinal fluid has leaked out through the cisterns and so the subarachnoid space is no longer visible unless I move the brain, but it's very, very soft. Notice, it's, it's totally squishy. It's um, the consistency it's much softer than most of the meat you would see in a market. So if I were to pinch this, in either way, I could easily damage this with my thumb. 
In fact, neurosurgeons, when they are doing surgery, often just evacuate with a vacuum or suck out parts of the brain. This string here has been placed around the basal artery so it can be suspended in a bucket of formaldehyde in order to denature the protein and harden it. If we didn't, it would sit on the bottom of the bucket and the brain would become deformed as, as you would see here so that it would be compressed in this direction just from the weight of the brain. So that points out one of the purposes of the cerebral spinal fluid is to fl I'll stop. I'll stop it there and, and just talk about uh, what she was going to talk about. So our brain cannot hold its own weight. In our skull, it's, it's contained in a pressurized sac and it's floating in fluid. It's literally floating there. And so you can imagine getting a hit to your head. It's bouncing around in that fluid. It's soft. It's about the texture of jello and bumping up into the bony, uh, the bony brain, the skull rather. These are the brain changes that occur uh, it, when, they're, when someone suffers a concussion. This is kind of a brief overview of them just for time, but I'm happy to answer any more questions you might have afterwards. So the brain, of course, is made up of neurons, and a concussion occurs when some kind of impact to the brain, to the body, to the head, makes those neurons not work anymore. Okay? Most of the time it's temporarily, they don't die, but it stops them from working. And so they, the impact stretches a neuron, it pulls it apart, and there's things inside that neuron that need to be in there. And there's things on the outside that shouldn't be in there. And when it pulls apart, some things go in that shouldn't be, and some things go out that shouldn't be. Right? These are primarily sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride. Right? And they're all over the place. And it's kind of like a snow globe. Right? Your brain's shooken up, and all these kind of chemicals are floating around in the brain. And while those chemicals are floating around, the person has symptoms of concussion. So when they have a headache, or they can't balance correctly, it's because sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride are all over the place. They're not where they need to be, and the neurons can't fire. And that's what is uh, a concussion. And so while the neuron is off, the person feels the symptoms of a concussion. But a concussion really is just the tip of the iceberg. There's this idea of subconcussive injuries. And subconcussive injuries are when somebody has an impact to the head that's strong enough to affect neurons but they don't have any immediate symptoms, right? Hurts their head, neurons aren't functioning the way they should be, but they don't express any symptoms. Maybe they don't even recognize them themselves. And these seem to be the biggest problem as it relates to long-term health problems associated with repetitive concussion. It's not the six or seven that you recognize, it's the 300 that you didn't, right? Um, there was a fantastic study in the military a few years ago that worked, looked at these guys called breachers, Breachers are soldiers that blow up doors and things like that. So they would set an explosive, they would leave a good distance away and have the door explode, right? While they're in training, they looked at brain changes, they looked, they gave some chemical tests, or some blood tests rather, some cerebral spinal fluid tests, and they saw markers of brain death, even though not a single soldier reported experiencing a concussion from that training. Isn't that interesting? We know the brain was damaged, but this, the patients, the soldiers in this case, didn't even know that they had a concussion. They probably didn't. They had a subconcussive injury. Isn't that interesting? Some sports, like football in some positions, are very prone to these. Football linemen might have 1,000 or 1,500 of these hits every single year at 20 to 30 Gs. This is the equivalent of driving your car into a brick wall at 35 miles per hour. So these are really strong, big guys, 1,000 to 1,500 times uh, a year doing this. 1,000 to 1,500 times driving your car into a brick wall at 35 miles per hour. That is insane. In most cases, the brain returns to normal activity within a couple weeks, like Laura talked about. However, repetitive exposure to concussions and subconcussive injuries has been associated with a brain disease that causes dementia. And, and one way to kind of resolve this might be if we have enough rest in between, that we you know, don't have repetitive concussions over and over. So this next slide, I want to show you some results of a study that I'm currently working on here at Manchester with a couple of students. We collected a survey last year asking people about their concussive experiences throughout their lifespan, right? And we also asked them, of these concussions, of all, all these that you've had throughout your life, how many did you return to your normal activities before you didn't have any symptoms anymore? Are you guys with me, right? 
And so in this study, 65% of people who suffered a concussion returned to normal activity before their symptoms resolved. 65%. Most people. Isn't that interesting? It's fascinating. And then we are interested in knowing about, well, when were these concussions occurring in their life, and when were they returning back to play? And what we found is that elementary school, middle school, and adults were doing the worst. The group that was waiting to return to normal activities when they were asymptomatic, when all the symptoms resolved, the most were high school players. Isn't that interesting? So high school seemed to be doing the best. But everybody's doing bad. So chronic traumatic encephalopathy is not a new disease. Will Smith movie came out last year. It was awesome ads. They were great. Right? And the kind of line to sell the movie was this is a new disease. It's not a new disease. Right? This disease was first discovered in 1928. It was called Punch Drunk. It was written in the Journal of American Medical Association as Punch Drunk. And it was called Punch Drunk because boxers were thought to, after they get hit enough, act like they were always drunk. They had like slurred speech and you know, couldn't walk right, things like that. And it was called punch, blunt, punch drunk, rather. A few years later, it gets turned into the term dementia pugilistica, or the dementia of boxers. And nowadays, we call it chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Okay? Been around for a long time. We've known about the brain changes for a long, long time. Uh, it is not a new disease. But something big happened in 2002. In 2002, this guy right here, Mike Webster, died. He was only 50 years of age. And he, he was a Pittsburgh Steeler. He died in Pittsburgh. And the pathologist who was there that day decided to cut up his brain, to autopsy his brain. He said, something's weird here. It's not looking right. Cuts up his brain, and he finds CTE, or punch drunk, or dementia pugilistica, whatever you want to call it, in the brain of a football player. And this changed the game. Now we weren't talking about this disease in just boxers. Uh, we are talking about maybe in football players as well. Does that make sense? This is a big game changer. CT has only been found in people with repetitive brain trauma. That suggests that you got to have repetitive brain trauma to have this brain disease. It causes the brain to shrink off and die. die. There's a widespread accumulation of this protein. It's called tau. Um, and it can only be diagnosed at death. Okay? The only way to diagnose this disease right now is when somebody dies, you cut up their brain. I know it sounds morbid, a little bit. It's a little gross. You cut up their brain, and you look for this disease. And that's what this looks like. These are two very thin slices of a human brain. This was a football player. Very thin slices that were stained for that protein tau. The protein turns up black on these slides. And I think you can see there, the football player, does everybody see that black marks? That's tau. That's bad neurons. That's dead neurons. On the left side there, we see a healthy brain, a person who died of cancer, wasn't, a brain, wasn't brain disease involved, stained it for the chemical for tau, and it doesn't have it in there. Right? So this is what the disease looks like. And if you want to know more about it, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have later on. This is a very, very short list of NFL players who have died with CT in their brains. So I mean that they have died, and a pathologist has dissected their brain and found CT in their brains. Very, very short list. I could have gone 100 players or more, right? Just to give you an example, in a recent study, uh, this is the BU's brain bank, which is thought of as the NFL's brain bank. 96% of those brains have been diagnosed with CT. 96%, right? That's pretty much everybody okay, of these NFL football players. Of course, it's different if you're talking about high school. We don't know that. Uh, if you're talking about only people that play college, we don't know that. But at least in this group, this one sample, boy, that's a lot of, lot of disease. Right? Some of the symptoms of CT, there's two different profiles. There's a younger onset that's associated with emotional problems, impulsivity, being irrational, depressed. And then there's an older onset that's associated with long-term problems with memory, or problems with long-term memory. They develop dementia, problems with working memory, and things like that. And we're going to see that in the video. We're going to see a guy, we're going to see Mike Webster, uh, and we're going to see dementia in action. If you had never seen anybody with dementia, it's a really debilitating, obviously debilitating condition and really sad to see. Since 2002, when it was first discovered in a, uh, outside of boxing, 
It's now been found in baseball players, hockey players, rugby players, soccer players, wrestling. I've seen it in a lot of sports now. It's been diagnosed in people in their teens who've committed suicide, and then their brains have been dissected. And of course, all the way up the spectrum to 80 years of age. So we see it in young folks, we see it in old folks. Of course, it's worse in the older folks. The disease pathology is worse, and I'll talk about why that might be. But it's found at all levels, and uh, all age groups, and it's also been found at all levels of play from high school uh, up. It's also been found in a, a good number of military personnel that are exposed to blast traumas. It's the same mechanism of action to the brain. So it's not just boxers anymore. It's not just football players. We're finding it in a lot of people. All right, just have two more slides for you guys. This is a theoretical model of what CTE looks like. On the bottom there, you have age growing, growing across time. And on the left axis there, you have somebody who's ranging from normal to impaired. And the current thinking is that you have a concussion, and maybe you return to normal. You wait a couple weeks, everything's cool, and you're back to normal. And you have another concussion. I apologize, they're not showing up. It's supposed to be showing lines. You have another concussion, and everything goes back to normal. And then you have another concussion, everything goes back to normal. And then there's this gap period. Maybe you stop playing sports, and the symptoms don't appear for another 20 years. And then when you hit 40 or you hit 45, you start to have cognitive problems. You start to have emotional problems and things that, like that. There seems to be this delayed onset. And that's been attributed to an abnormal immune response that's going on during those 20, 30 years, continuing to eat up neurons, and the brain is slowly dying off over time. And we really pick up those symptoms when somebody starts to be about 40 and 50 years of age. So just to be clear, you may, someone might play sports for the first 20 years of their life, a lot of concussions. They may stop playing sports and be just fine. 20 years later, get the disease. They've always had the disease. It's just taken a while for it to be expressed. You guys with me? OK. In a moment, we're going to, I'm happy to take answer questions before we do this, but in a moment, we're going to watch this PBS documentary that talks, it's called League of Denials, the NFL's concussion crisis. And there'll be a little bit of gap in between so people can go to the bathroom and things like that. And this documentary presents the discovery of CT in a professional football player. We'll see the pathologist who discovered CT in Mike Webster's brain. We'll see Mike Webster both dead and alive. Um, it suggests that the NFL may have tried to cover up the impact of playing football on the brain. Suggests that the NFL tried to discredit the scientists who found the disease in a football player, and we'll show you more about this. And there's also been recent accounts of more of this going on, OK? Uh, more of this of an active attempt to suppress scientific finding. And I'm happy to answer questions about that if, you, if you're interested. Uh, so I guess we'll leave it there, and I'll take any questions you may have. Any questions? Sorry if I scared you. That's scary. I didn't mean to. It's a little nauseous now. <laughs> Was it around uh, Mike Webster that this whole thing became a bigger focus? Absolutely, yeah. So uh, because of what Mike Webster, it, it blew up, right? Because now it wasn't just boxers, right? Now it was the sport that captured our attention that we all love, you know? Um, and just it grew from there. You know? And he's an interesting guy. We'll see some stuff. We'll see some videos on him. Have there been any proposed um, or put into action any like possible treatments between the phase of someone um, playing sports known to have a lot of concussions and then the time the, the later symptoms I, I love this question. It's a very, very, very good question, very important question. So the question is, we have this delay. We have a lot of concussions, maybe a 20-year gap, and then we get the disease. And is there any research in better understanding what's going on in those 20 years and how you can treat it? right? The answer for CT is no. It's only been since 2002, so nobody knows the answer to that. But this same model is what we know is true for Alzheimer's disease. So in Alzheimer's disease nowadays, we think that disease pathology is starting in somebody's 20s and 30s. It takes 20 years to develop into dementia, right? And a lot of drug studies are working on intervening at that time and changing the inflammatory response. Nobody's done that in CT. The model is still there. 
could be used that way, might be beneficial. We'd have, we'll have to wait and see. Has to be a long-term study. It's a good question. Any other questions? I feel like I scared you guys. I'm sorry. Is this on? Or? Yeah. Can. Okay. <laughs> um, so you referenced uh, some like legal action and controversy that's come up with the NFL supposedly covering some of this up. Mm -hmm. um, do you see us getting any further, uh, sort of accepting that it's a problem and just not accepting that it's being covered up? That um, do I see? Say one more time. So. So yeah, my question is. Um, <coughs> as a society who really, you know, comes together around football and sort of watches football games in mass numbers, do you see us coming around anytime soon to acknowledging that there is a big epidemic on our hands and we need to be more aware and combating it? It's, it's a great question. Um, so, unfortunately, I think we have a long ways to go uh, in doing that. Um, think, of a, think of a PC way to put it. No, it was fine. <laughs> well, let me tell you a little more. Maybe it's on PC, but let me tell you a little bit more. You're gonna you're gonna see some of this in that in that video, right? You're gonna see some of the things that was done to kind of suppress science, right? And there has been a change since then in a different a tactic by this group. Okay, I'm gonna leave the name out, but you get the idea, right? Where this group recently, after this documentary, said, okay, everyone thinks we're biased. Here's what we're gonna do to fix that problem. We're going to give $30 million to the National Institutes of Health, and the National Institutes of Health is going to choose who does the research. That way, I'm not getting in the way. Do you see what I'm saying? Here's what happened, though. So they did that. This group gave that $30 million or pledged it to the NIH. The NIH did an open request for research protocols, right? Somebody got that protocol or got that research grant that could be inconsistent with this group's perspective, and they withdrew the funding, right? They were willing to fund it if certain researchers got the money, but not if others. Does that kind of answer your question? So no, I think we have a long ways to go. Uh, in personal opinion, I think here's what we've got to do for concussions, particularly as it relates to sports, especially with adults, is say concussions are a problem, and now you have to, the person has to decide if they want to participate. It's totally fine, right? But I think they have to have that right to say, I get it. You give me education. I know what could happen to me. Do I want to take that risk or not? Oh, sound reasonable? Sound horrible? I don't know. Yeah. As opposed to So having some kind of regular basis of doing those assessments so you can really track the change over time, I think that is a fantastic idea. Um, I don't know how that would get funded. You know, I don't know if health insurance companies would pay for that or something like that. But boy, I think if you want to understand the changes that could occur from these can, from these injuries, that's the best way to do it. Right. I don't. I don't know practically how that might pan out. You know? yeah. All right, any last minute questions? We'll take like a, I don't know, like a five minute break and then we'll watch this video. Does that sound okay? All right, thanks guys.